Thank you for having me. And uh, so let's see if I got this one. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay. It's uh, good to be back in Canada and in the Fields Institute. Uh, this is a mathematics institute. You see the blackboards with the chalk and stuff, but uh, I will restrict myself to the uh, to my slides, and there, but there will be formulas in the slides, okay? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so what this, so uh, given the format and uh, how many of you are around here, just please feel to, free to interrupt me if something is not clear when I define things, because everything builds on things gradually and so, uh, um, so you can just feel free to interrupt me it's, uh, in this format, it's easy. So this, uh, what this talk will be, uh, will be about uh, is uh, I will spend time basically discussing the so-called short dated options and uh, I, will, I will develop, uh, well, in a series of my, some of my work, I, I've basically been working for the last few years of developing various methods non-parametric or in finance they like to call this thing model free basically ways to analyze uh, this option data and i'll show you what i've done uh, so far on this now just to give you a sense of this short edit options and what is a short edit option okay short edit option is just like the name uh, uh, says it's an option which has a short time to expiration basically you're looking at options which expire very close to uh, uh, very uh, very soon okay and so, uh, so when I started doing research in option, uh, you know, with options uh, many years ago, when I was a graduate student, I remember that the rule was drop any observations or any options which have uh, less than two weeks to expiration. So that, that was kind of the norm, because the common wisdom was that there's just not, not much liquidity in these in this option contracts. Then we accidentally found in the data that we, at some point, we start throwing half of the data with this rule, and then we revisit it, and then we kind of uh, got surprised what's going on here. Uh, luckily, you know, uh, we, uh, when I say we, my colleague Torben Anderson and myself, we went to, uh, to the, one of the exchanges downtown in Chicago and asked them about this. And uh, yeah, they said, yeah, that's real, you know, that there's a lot of liquidity in these things and people are trading them. Uh, so, and uh, this has gotten even more extreme, I think uh, Lars mentioned this thing about the zero DTE, so if you Google it, you will find it too. Now what happened was that uh, they introduced the weeklies, the, so they, they call those options weeklies with weekly expiration cycle, which means that these options are issued on a Friday and they expire next Friday, okay? So that's considered a short dated option. They started initially with the Friday expirations. People like them, and then they start issuing Monday and Wednesday and expiration dates. And now, on the, if you look at the S&P 500 index, which is the proxy for the market index in the US, uh, you have actually, as of now, we have options which expire every day of the business week. So Monday through Friday, okay? So we have every day, there's an expiration date. So you can basically trade really this short dated risk. And uh, the volume has gradually picked up. So this one plot um, in which, uh, just to summarize this, just look at SPX, the S&P 500 index. And, uh, and what I plotted here is, uh, no, that was not the right button. Okay, so uh, now let's see, there are three buttons. How can you get it wrong? But uh, apparently, uh, now let's see, uh, how do I get myself back into the full screen view? All right. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm back. I'm good. Thank you. No, no. I'm not that illiterate. I can sort of <laughs> I can manage uh, to full, full screen mode. Okay, so um, yeah, initially, if you go back in 2007, you will see that the volume of options traded with one week to expiration was a little bit less than 10%, and then it gradually increased to 20%. It's a little bit downplaying the importance of the, the, the short dated options. Because, uh, because uh, what this thing is, uh, in a lot of these dates here, there were just none, none of them, right? And so you're dividing on something which is by definition zero because they, they didn't have those short maturities uh, issued. And so if you zoom in now and you just look at now conditions, so do it slightly differently, the data, and look at volume of options traded on days when there is an expiration date. Basically, they are options which expire on the same day, zero day. And you can see this volume has start picking up. I'm using option metrics here, uh, and for whatever reason, they can't update their data 
but if you look at 2022, uh, this has even shooted up even more. So it's like uh, right now, I mean, what I'm seeing here, it's over 30%, it's from zero date options. And uh, I read it in, because when I teach, I usually follow the financial press, and then uh, that uh, zero DTEs uh, have picked up a lot uh, over the last year, uh, mainly facilitated by this daily expiration dates that were introduced. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a, I'm sorry. Yeah, so these are years, so the axis are 2010, and we go all the way to 2021. So these are just years, these are by years. Uh, oh, oh, so, oh, sorry, oh, you mean here. So what are the bars? The, 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 the blue is zero day, and then the red one is from zero day to one week, and then you get from one week to one month, the next chart, and then you get from one month to three months, and then at the very top, that little, little piece, is something which is more than a year after expiration. Volume, volume, traded volume of, of options uh, uh, on, uh, on the S&P 500, which is the biggest, uh, the biggest contract. Um, this is not just constrained to, to, to zero day. If I condition on a day when there's one day to expiration option, and then you will see that those guys also uh, kind of concentrated. So if you're thinking that this might be because the GISA people are closing their positions, that's not what's driving uh, that. It's just real trading of options. Uh, with very short dead, uh, uh, time to expiration. So we got, uh, we got inspired by this, kind of, well, this, 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 this thing, the zero day is a very recent thing. And so I, I did get inspired by that for, to do something, which I'm not going to show you today because it's too preliminary. But uh, and so we looked at this data and, uh, you know, the volume was one way to measure liquidity, but for many of the things which we need to do, you just be also interested with the option data and how many strikes you have, right? So strikes per maturity. And so basically how many options with different strikes, that, that's what matters to you, as you will see for some of the expansions that uh, I'm going to do later on. And those are out of the money options, because basically either you take only puts or you take only calls, or you just take out of the money options, a put or a call. And that's, uh, that's how we count those. And these are zero, uh, what, you see on the, what you see on the top plot here. Oh, yeah, I keep doing that. Uh, so the, sorry, so, uh, so these are zero date options on the, on the, on the, uh, no worries. All right, so these are, these are this, uh, what is on the x-axis, this is the time of the trading, uh, the, the, the trading day. So we are looking at starting in the morning, and going all the way, this is the options, actually they, they close it here, they expire at four o'clock, okay? And so look, this is a zero day option, and then you're getting the, 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 the 50th quantile is the one, that, the dots in the middle, or the circles in the middle, okay? And what you see here is that you, you basically start with, on average, something like 30 strikes, that's a lot, right? I mean, and then you go all the way down, only when you approach four o'clock, basically this starts shrinking really. Why? Because you have a minimum tick size and then, you know, that become, all of a sudden becomes a very big move if you are like one minute to expiration. But even just one minute to expiration, you'll still see a lot of volume. If you look at the one day option, now they, of course, they will have at the end of the trading day, they will have one more day to expiration. It's a very healthy, stable, basically strike count of 70, uh, 70 options. So that, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot for us to play with, okay? And uh, if you look at the, yeah. Do we have an idea how many of these are dropped by algorithm? Ah, uh, this is very difficult to know. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I would. I would. I would. Especially since I'm recorded, I would not say anything more. <laughs> so, yeah. That, that we should have taken this option off the table, you know, the recording. And so, uh, yeah. I said some kind of there's some anecdotal evidence, but you know, I wouldn't. I, yeah, I don't think it's only algo, algo trading here. Um, okay, and then the other dimension on which we can measure for us liquidity is important is how big is the range of the strikes. And what I mean by this is basically, uh, say the, the, the strike, you compare it to the stock price, and you think how big is that gap in terms of standard deviations, okay? Uh, how many standard deviations, and so, you know, uh, uh, and if you look at the, the strike gap for the zero date options, what you can see is that uh, they, they're pretty good strike, uh, strike range from five sigmas, five standard deviations, all the way to three sigmas. 
And only at the very end, it starts basically kind of narrowing a little bit. But uh, even when it, at the very end, you're still like two sigmas, which is not, not so bad. So that's pretty good. And then when you're looking, of course, at the one-day options, they actually have no, um, no, no problem with, on, on that dimension. So overall, this is just suggestive evidence that it's just a lot of trading, a lot of volume. Um, BIDAS spreads are normal. They are not that different from any other options you see with any other expirations. And the strike range and the number of strikes is pretty good. And so basically, I will uh, develop now what I will do now in this, in this talk. We'll discuss with you methods for doing uh, all sorts of non-parametric analysis uh, with these short dated options. Okay. Those were the plots for now. Now we go to math a little bit. But again, it will be not that much, so uh, don't, don't worry. Um, so then you ask yourself, what can we learn from these options? And why, uh, you know, like, uh, so, so let's just basically just think about what we can learn from this, what is the best thing we can hope for, and then try to see methods or uh, ways to separate or, or, or analyze, uh, uh, analyze the data. Okay. And so, we will work in continuous time because it's, it's much easier when you work with options to be to cast things in continuous time, and so uh, so we will have a, an underlying price here, which will evolve according to this uh, this equation. So uh, um, so what we have is a stochastic volatility. So many of you are familiar with this terminology here. So this is the stochastic volatility. This is DW is a Brownian motion increment, and this thing is a jump part of the uh, process. Okay. Uh, so, a little bit of, uh, so I will not spend much time with explaining no notation, but just to say a little bit here about this notation of jumps you might not be familiar with, but it's actually not a very complicated thing. Mu is a measure which counts how many jumps took place over an interval of length dt and of size dx. Okay? That's all it, it means. Mu is just, it, it counts. It's a counting measure. It's about a realization. And mu is uh, how many jumps of this size over that interval you expect uh, to happen, okay? So mu is about the realization and mu is about the expectation, okay? That's, and so when I, when I look at mu minus mu, what happens is basically that's like a martingale measure. So, and that puts this piece here, the jump piece here on equal footing with the continuous piece here, which is also a martingale. So it's just a convenient way of representing uh, the, um, the, uh, the the jumps in this uh, in this uh, in this setting. Okay, now everything here. Yeah, you know. Question. So we were talking about the description of the data, but really now I only focus on short dated options. Yes. I don't look anymore to the others, and is that specific for that combination there, or is it is it a more general? Uh, oh no! You mean this? No, no. This, oh, again, I keep doing that. Uh, okay, no, no, no. This is this is this doesn't. This obviously there's an, an underlying dynamics which holds. So they, they, this is not related to the short dated options. But what will be related to the short dated options? What I will tell you is what we can learn about these dynamics from the short dated options and in a model free way, right? I mean, this thing there's an underlying model dynamics. It does and. Uh, from seeing options written on the price, we'll be able to extract something about these pieces here of the, of the model. Okay. Just to clarify, again, if you are familiar with option data, this should be no surprise. But of course, there is a risk neutral measure, and then there is a pro statistical probability measure. The usual notation P is for the true probability, and Q is for the risk neutral probability. Pricing of options will be under the risk neutral probability. But the good thing is that, at least if you're interested in this piece here, is that that's the same under P and Q, right? I mean, so sigma T doesn't, uh, because of uh, uh, equivalence of the two probability measures. It's not, the, that's not true for, for the jumps, and the jump basically, uh, in fact, uh, this t the, uh, what, what this new is uh, can be very different. Basically, what your expectation, because it's an expectation, and expectation can be different under the, 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 the true probability measures. And so, and in fact, typically that, that's a very different, this new, this compensator, or how many jumps you expect under the risk neutral probability measure is just very, very, very different from the true realization of jumps. And basically that's a risk premium uh, component that I'll come back to. Okay, so there's the underlying dynamics. And now let's see, 
what we are, we can, and what we are going to use is just uh, introduce here notation option data. And so, uh, uh, so hopefully my notation is intuitive. C stands for call and P for put, okay? Uh, uh, for put. Theoretically, the value of these are, are the options, as you are familiar, this is the payoff of a call, and then you just take the conditional expectation, okay? And, and, and the same thing for the puts. Hopefully, this is no surprise here for you. Uh, and uh, what I've done, of course, you might have noticed that I have forgot about discounting. Um, uh, it's because we will be looking at short edit options, and I can just, just pretend it's not there. It really makes no difference and it just simplifies the notation so I don't carry around uh, uh, risk-free interest rates and dividend yields and things like this. But it makes no, no difference. This is just to simplify uh, exposition. Okay, so this is what we have. Uh, so this is what we are going to work with. We, we have a bunch of calls and puts with different strikes, right? That's basically what we will be given access to. And what I'll be interested when I say short dated options, I mean that the capital T, which is the time to expiration, is short. And if you do asymptotics with this thing, it means that you are thinking of what happens when t uh, goes to, uh, to zero. That's basically what, uh, what I will be using here. All right. So again, I'm kind of continuing on this topic on what can we extract from short dated options. So now many of you know that, so that's a well-known fact, uh, that if, uh, if you take the, sec the, the second derivative of the call price, and that's a trivial algebra, you can, you can, uh, you can differentiate under the integral, under conditions, of course, uh, you recover the risk neutral density. Okay. So now, risk neutral density, which means that basically, if I observe all strikes for a given capital T, and there's no, here there's no assumptions on how big is T, then I can recover the whole risk neutral density, right? I mean, we, we can invert and recover the risk neutral density. Now, here comes on the one, two, three, uh, the fourth bullet point, the second to last, is where the, 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 the time to maturity starts playing a role. Because if the model is levy, and so I don't know how, uh, whether you know the, uh, what levy means, levy basically means, uh, let me just go back here, levy means that the sigma doesn't depend on t, so the volatility is constant, and that the jump intensity is constant. So in other words, if the model is IID, it has IID returns, okay? So in this case, it's a well-known fact that actually the law over one increment identifies uniquely the law of the process, okay? So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between knowing the distribution over one increment of the, of the process and knowing the whole distribution of the process, characterizing completely the process. It's a one-to-one -one map if the model is levy. Model is not levy because volatility changes over time. We know, we know that the true, in, in reality, that's not the case. But if time to maturity is short, actually, we can pretend, um, basically, if time to maturity is short, it's the same approximately, volatility remains constant over the interval, and so does the jump intensity. And so what that means is, uh, what can we identify from the short edit options? We should be able to identify from the short dated options, both sigma t, just the value of sigma t, it's a random number, but I should be able to identify it at time t, its value, okay? And I should be able to identify even perhaps more importantly, because you can't do it from returns, the value of the jump compensator. That's a function, right? Nu is a function. Sigma or sigma t is a, is a value, it's a, it's a real number, a positive number. But nu is a function which tells you what is uh, the distribution, the jump distribution, right? The distribution over the jump size, right? So you can identify both those two things from short edit options. This is what's uh, basically unique about the short edit options. We should be able from following that logic which I, fo uh, which I showed you here, I know that I can, if I have all the strikes, I can identify the risk neutral distribution because over short intervals of time, the model has to be approximately levy, or in other words, with IID increments, uh, then I should be able to identify both the volatility and the jump distribution, um, uh, um, the distribution over jump sizes um, from the short dated options. That's as, much, that's, that's as much as I can get from the 
uh, from the uh, from, from, from the data and that's what we are going and to basically to achieve well well we are going and uh, that's what we are going to do here actually that's not all what you can identify with this so but the first order effect so the first thing is this what you can identify afterwards hope to do but it gets a little bit more difficult is um, things which capture how sigma t varies over time or how new t varies over time and things like that. There actually, there's a second layer of things you can identify uh, as well, but it gets a little bit more uh, uh, evolved. The, the things which I will show you here, I think are relatively straightforward, at least in terms of methods and implementation, so it's not going to be uh, that difficult. And so, so my first part of, of, of the talk, so basically before, the, we, before we take, uh, we have coffee, I will talk about, somehow I will reverse them. I'll start from the jumps and then I'll go back to the volatility. Somehow the jumps is a little bit more tricky. Um, and so I will start from there and then I'll go back to the, uh, to the volatility, although probably uh, given the size of the literature on volatility, I should have probably start with volatility and then go to jumps. Okay, so I'll do it this way. Okay, so I'll start with this. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, that's the first part. Uh, so something about the jumps, okay. And so how do we recover the, how do we recover this jump distribution? It's uh, from, from, the, from the short dated options. And they are different, so um, there are different ways you can approach that problem. And the way I'm going to, basically what I'm going to show you is the way we, uh, I and some of my, by the way, this is based on a lot of papers that I have written with many people. And so, uh, and so uh, the way I started thinking about this was uh, from something which should be probably easier and arguably probably important because it is about tail risk. So something about the tail. So I'll just try to recover this function here which captures again, this is a function over the jump size. I'll just try to characterize it in the tails for the extremes, okay? For the extreme size, okay? So, um, so I will try, uh, we will do this. This should be an easier thing. Uh, and it is, um, it is, but requires a little bit more assumptions as you will see uh, later on. And so then what I will do actually, and then I will go and recover the whole function. So there's, Turns out, actually, that's not that difficult. Um, and finally, I will spend a little bit of time on talking of this thing, which probably, when I write it like this, it doesn't tell you much. Fixed times of discontinuity. Uh, but here, I just follow probability literature. And fixed times of discontinuity, that's how they are defined. Uh, and what I'm talking in simple words about, these are the so-called event risk if there's an FOMC announcement or if you have an earnings announcement and things like this, this is the thing which is pre-announced, where you basically know when the jump will arrive. The typical, the standard jumps which we use in our continuous time models, they usually say they're like Poisson distributed, right? Randomly distributed arrive. But actually, for a lot of the, a lot of the jumps that have interest, maybe uh, this, uh, this, uh, this type of, uh, the ones like FOMCs and things like this, this is actually, um, there's no uncertainty about the, the, the time of the jump. Okay, so I will discuss this because again, I, I just think that it, uh, the techniques there are a little bit different, but uh, but I think that it's actually quite practical uh, this 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 topic because uh, uh, in addition to that, if you look if you have looked at option data, I don't know whether you have looked at this type of data for individual stocks before announcements. It's just an explosion of trading, right? Because it's like an auction on what's going to happen with uh, basically the, the, to read what's happening with the earning. Okay, so so let's get uh, let's get started then. So the first thing is, as I said, I will try and talk about this tail parameter or the, the, this tail component of the of the uh, of the measure. Okay, and so so something about the big the, something about the big size. Okay, so. How do we do that? Uh, okay, and that's the option data I'm going to use. I already defined them, but so basically uh, for you, so I don't need to spend much time here to explain, just to say that what I'll be looking at, I will looking out of the money options, which means that options, you take either the call if the strike is above the spot price today, or you take the put if the strike is below the stock price today. 
these options, if they are expiring today, they will be worth zero. Okay. So these are cheap, these are cheap options. And as the time to maturity approaches zero, these guys decline in value, right? There's a time value which is decay kind of, 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 of the option. So we are just using out of the money, uh, out of the money options. All right, so here's the, here, how, how, how one way to, an, an easy way to, uh, to identify these tails is the following. Uh, basically, you say the, the, is the, the, the thought process is captured by the two, the two bullet points. So you say, okay, if I'm looking over a very small interval of time, okay, uh, then uh, the only way I can generate a big move uh, of a, a big return is if there was a jump, right? And so, in fact, the jump truncation in high frequency data, return data procedures are based on the same idea. And so, of course, there's a, there's a specific threshold which is considered big and which is considered small. And so, and so basically, uh, if, I, if I'm looking at larger and larger thresholds um, and over smaller and smaller intervals of time, returns over smaller and smaller intervals of time, the only way they can be triggered or uh, happen is basically if there was a jump. So if I'm looking, just to give you a, a sense, if I'm looking at one day to expiration option and I have 10 standard deviation move, that cannot not going to happen with a diffusive volatility move. It has to be a jump, okay? And so technically there is an asymptotic formal argument which basically tells you, allows you to link the tail behavior of the return with the tail behavior of the jump component, okay? Even if you don't, no. so the, of course there's an approximation error in this, right? I mean, they did this, so I will tell you that the return over two days uh, a 5% can be generated only by a, by a jump. I mean, I, immediately you can see how there's some kind of a wild volatility move which can generate probably something like this. Even if you're not happy and don't buy this assumption, what I'm going to show you here works perfectly, meaning that I will be always recovering the tail of the return, okay? Of the short return over a short interval of time. Whether you want to link it to all the other jumps, it's up to you. A kind of, there will be an approximation error. We can improve on that once we go to the alternative method that I'm going to tell you. But what this, this will do, it will give me just a very simple thing to identify the tail, as you will see now. Okay, so I will assume the usual thing, a regular variation of the, of the, if you have worked with uh, 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 this tails or extreme value theory, then the, the natural thing which you do is you assume that there's a regular variation of the Levy measure uh, in the tails. Uh, but you have to be careful, you have to do it. Uh, you can't assume a power law decay for log jumps, for jumps in the log price, because then the price will be infinite, and so infinite moments, so that's not going to work. And so what I will going to assume is that this is technical detail, so in some sense this is not so important, but uh, I will assume that the regular variation is for the, for the jump in the level, not in the, not in the log, in the log price, okay. So, that, so this transforma fancy transformation, complicated transformation is just for that. So this Psi is just to capture that, okay? And then all I'm saying is, and, uh, is that the functions, which is basically the behavior of these jump measures in the tails, you see it's like this. It's X to the power minus alpha times something which is a slowly varying function. And because of this function L of X, I can call it a non-parametric procedure, okay? That's what extreme value theory people do, okay? They call this thing uh, non-parametric. But in reality, you basically just forget, you say, uh, you, you forget about this L, and you do like, the, the basically the tail of the measure is like X to the power minus alpha, which is a parametric law. And what a parametric model, if you have worked with this, this is the double exponential model. That's basically what it is for the jumps. Double exponential model, in the tails, that, that's all we are assuming, okay? There's a lot of fanciness here, which we don't need to spend, basically how much is this slowly varying function deviating from one and things like this. These are, in, in a way, these are details, they're not important. But what this thing does is, you see, if I look at now at the option price and I normalize it by the stock price, it's basically driven by two parameters. I don't know whether this becomes obvious because there's just a lot of pluses and minuses, but there are two parameters. One is the level, and this is AT, and the other one is the alpha, which is the tail decay parameter, okay? So you have a tail decay parameter on the left and tail decay parameter on the right, okay? 
And that's basically, you're saying that approximately the option price is in the tails when you're looking at deep out of the money, uh, deep out of the money puts and calls, they have this kind of a parametric, parametric law. Or even more explicit, just to, to, to show you what, what's happening here, if I take the log of the option price, the log of the option price is a linear function of the log of the strike. Okay. It's a linear function, just a simple linear function. And so how can I estimate these parameters? Well, just run the OLS, basically a log option price against log strike. So in some sense, this is, again, if you have done anything with extreme value theory, this is basically like the Hill estimator. It's the same thing, but you apply it with option prices. So let me show you how this thing looks on data. Uh, this is one point uh, uh, observation. So these are short dated options from ancient times when we didn't have zero DTEs, or they, they were there, but probably not traded that much, okay? And so what I plotted on, so what you're seeing is on the X axis, you're seeing log moneyness. And so if you, if you are familiar, but this, what that means is that basically this is the log of the strike over the spot price, okay? And so zero means that you are at the money, that's the at the money option. And to the left, you're looking at out of the money puts, and to the right, you're looking out of the money calls, okay? And so basically that means here that the, this, this option that I'm looking here is four standard deviations down, strike which is four standard deviations down. It's just easier to quote with standard deviations because you're kind of thinking about returns and how big are those. Uh, moves. And so the stars or the dots on the on the plot, these are the log option prices, the log option prices, okay? And as you see on the top is the highest one, that's basically the add the money option price, and then you're seeing kind of they are gradually decaying, the monotonicity restriction on the option prices, and then here they're also gradually decaying. And what is remarkable is that this thing fits pretty well. Right? I mean, it's just a, such a simple thing in the tail. Uh, you see, for the, pull, for the calls, it fits pretty much from the add the money. But this, this, the, what's happening with the right tail, it's so thin that you see it's kind of dropping very fast. With the left tail, it's not as thin. And definitely, we are not, the, fun, the log option price is not linear in the log strike over the whole range. But that's fine because the extreme value theory is telling you that you should have linearity in the tails. And look, you pretty much from two and a half sigmas on, it does look like a, uh, like a straight line, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on, on the tail, yeah. So I, I, just, I just basically, the usual thing that we do with the high frequency thing, we take three sigmas down, basically something like here, because the asymptotics should kick in. You see, there is a kink actually, it's, uh, and you, you should you should kind of uh, um, do it uh, that way. So, okay, and um, then the, now one thing is that so that that's basically so you I mean you can if you want you can call that thing that uh, okay so I'm going in the wrong direction so you can call that thing a parametric model or if you don't like the parametric model, uh, basically there is the non-parametric error approximation coming from deviations from the power law. But um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> so, the, so it's a very simple law. And, um, and uh, the way the jumps can vary over time here can happen from two sources. One is level shifts. So the whole levy measure can shift up and down or the shape of the, 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 the tails can move over time. This level shifts, basically think about, this is the standard way in which we model time varying jump distribution. So you're saying that the jump intensity is varying, right? It's proportional to volatility, right? That's the, 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 the traditional models that we write in continuous time because of analytical tractability. They will tell you that basically the only way we can get this jump distribution to vary over time is if this, we shift the whole intensity for jumps of all sizes shifts up and down. Um, within this non-parametric setup, however, you can have also situations in which the shape of the distribution can, can change. And for example, we can get scared and, and basically, and only the big, big jumps in size can become uh, kind of more likely, uh, uh, in other words. And so that, that's basically an illustration of what I'm saying. And that's the level shift. This is the traditional parametric affine models. They will do you this. 
so you will you can kind of shift them up and down but you shift the whole level of the jump the jump intensity uh, and uh, and the shift the shape one is basically you're just twisting it right so you're doing this okay okay so um so I, we're done. So okay. So uh, that's it, and that estimation is super simple, as you can imagine. This is just running a bunch of OLS regressions over over different days, and uh, and so when we estimated this, this is what we got. I mean, as you can see here, my data ends in 2014. That's a little bit dated. Uh, it's taken from a paper that I've written with Tim Bolgoslav many years ago. Um, but this is what you will get if you estimate the tail parameter. Remember. Uh, the shape parameter, the, the, the shape parameter, okay, sorry, uh, the shape parameter will be the thing which is appearing here, which depends on the, on the moneyness, okay? And it tells you how fast the option prices decay in strikes, okay, as we get out of the money, okay? And so um, that parameter, what we've done, we took um, the inverse of that, and that's what we plotted here, okay? So one over that index. And so the reason why we did it one over the index is when you do it that way, high value means that the, the tail becomes fatter, okay? It becomes more fatter. And so, uh, uh, and you can see, basically, when we do our parametric models, we assume that that thing is constant. We just, we force this thing to be constant and we put all the variation to come here from this, uh, from this uh, intensity part. The data very clearly tells you when you get to these periods of the crisis of 08, et cetera, and later on, that there's actually, there's a lot of, uh, if you want in relative terms, the dip out of the money puts become much more expensive than say add the money uh, options, something like this, if this basically uh, is captured by this. And that on a fine model basically cannot, uh, parametric model cannot, uh, cannot do it, cannot capture it. Now, once we have, so basically with these two parameters, we have, oh, oh and, the, and on the right tail, I don't want to say much because if you look at especially the intensity parameter, you see how choppy it looks. So clearly it's not very reliably estimated because um, it's very small. And so maybe I don't care so much about it because it's just tiny. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's tiny. And so in fact, I, I'm going to concentrate on the left tail part here. And now these two parameters characterize the whole tail, okay? Uh, I can map it into tail variation, or in other words, I can basically calculate how much of the volatility of the return volatility comes from this left tail part, okay? Now that's easy to do. Uh, basically just calculate the second truncated moment the, 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 uh, from, from this model. That's not that difficult to do. And, um, and so these are the formulas here, okay? And uh, here's how it looks. Um, it looks like the VIX index, except that it's much more spiked during the crisis and, uh, um, and uh, in the crisis. And this is where the difference with the VIX index uh, will actually come from when we uh, go to return predictability, because that's basically what I'm going to do next. So one application of this analysis is basically, look, I, now I, what I have is I have, what is this? This is, the risk neutral expected tail variation, okay? Jump tail variation. And that's risk neutral. But if you look at the sigmas, uh, uh, and this is for how many, uh, for what did I say? For 10 sigma move, for 10 standard deviation move, okay? That thing, if you look at in the returns, it's pretty much zero. So what we decided is we just pretend that the, uh, the counterpart of this quantity under the true probability is zero. We just ignore it. And if that's the case, and what I'm looking at here should be just a risk premium, right? It's just a risk premium. But if it's a risk premium, it should help predict the returns, right? And so that's a one way economically to test that what I'm capturing is real. So, uh, and so what we did is we said, okay, well, I identified in a model free way, a tail variation from options. And now let's see if that thing predicts returns. And so here's a, this is from a paper I published in 2015 about this. And so we run the usual horse race predictive regression with all the caveats and all the, you know, things about these predictive regressions. And, uh, and that's the, basically the measure which I was using on the previous slides, which I was showing you is the first one here. 
and it does very well and uh, and it's kind of highlighted i wouldn't highlight I, I don't know we should not have put the red on the r squared because r squared is exactly the probably the last thing you want to look at in these predictive regressions but it's more driven by outliers and stuff but if you look at the t statistics they're pretty pretty high for this type of uh, predictive uh, regressions and it holds up well again basically it holds up well against alternative uh, uh, predictors used in the literature one of them is the so-called variance risk premium okay so i don't know whether you guys have heard about it but variance risk premium so uh, the, one of the quarters on this paper uh, meaning dollars left he has written about that uh, that variance risk premium which which is basically you look at the vix which you take from SIBO, and you subtract from it the realized volatility over the month, okay? And that thing, they've discovered in some of their earlier work that it's a very good predictor for stock returns going forward, okay? Variance risk premium, so these days you will actually probably see a lot used as a controls and checks uh, uh, as one of the potential candidates. And so, but now, what this jump variation that I'm extracting here, which is, okay, so, now it's completely messed up. Okay, so no, yeah, okay, so let me get back to this. Okay. Um, this jump variation here is just a component of the VIX index. And in fact, it's the tail part of the VIX index. And so what happens if you remove from this variance risk premium this tail component? And you basically you will see that this, this guy is basically almost driven out to, to almost nothing, basically, no predictability. So in other words, this variance risk premium that the source which we attribute for this predictability or success of the variance risk premium it's coming from this uh, tail part of the of the jump distribution a large piece of it uh, should be at least um, corresponding to it so if you do if you do over different horizons, so that what i showed you was for six months but if you can do it for any horizon starting from one month and going all the way down to one year so this is in, measured in months and so you see the black line is the T statistic corresponding to the, tail the left tail measure, okay? And then the dashed line is the one corresponding to what remains from the variance risk premium. So, vari so VRP minus LJV, so that the other component of the variance risk premium. And see that the other component of the variance risk premium, it's very, very tiny basically compared to the, uh, to the tail part. So yeah, so th that tail piece, it's big, it's significant. And just like it's internally consistent because it actually, it helps kind of, it drives also some of the predictability or some of the dynamics at least of the uh, equity risk premium. Okay. All right. So is that okay? Ish? Okay. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do is, uh, so that's a simple analysis and it, 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 okay, so let's see if I say it here. Yeah, okay, I say it here, yeah. Uh, theoretically, at least to develop this analysis, I, I, I did two things. I needed my time to maturity to go down to zero. And then I also had to use deep, deep out of the money options, okay? Now, uh, so this kind of like a double asymptotic type of kind of argument where you're going really deep in the tails at the same time as you're shrinking the time to maturity. If you don't want to uh, kind of, if you don't want to be making this, um, uh, the, if, you do, if, you, if you want to drop the first part of the assumption, then what I did so far is just estimating you the tails of the returns. And that's fine. You can, then, then it's perfectly interpretable. The part which requires T to go down to zero is the part which connects this with the jump behavior, okay? Um, but now, now what I will do is, uh, first of all, you just, require only estimate only part of the jump distribution and so what i will do now is an alternative method uh which re which basically gives you the whole jump distribution not just the tail part of it and uh, so i will not i will not require anything about strikes going to infinity well i will require them to increase to infinity but they, this component will not be such critical uh in all of this uh, and all of this analysis okay so so in that sense it's a more it's a more robust method. It's, it's prone to less error, basically. Approximation, error of approximating, if you're interested in, again, approximating the jump distribution uh, and not just the return distribution. Okay. So, 
So what will be that? So let me remind you again, one more <laughs> slide here, just to remind you, uh, that's a repetition. So what, what, what I'm interested in, remember, is the jump distribution. So the, basically this function, which I called new over x, the jump size. So I'm trying to see what is the distribution over the jumps of different size. I, call it, I keep calling it jump distribution, but in technical terms, that's not a jump distribution because this measure might explode in zero, around zero. So it actually only the x squared is uh, integrable around zero. But in some sense, this is probably a technical detail which we don't need to uh, get into because most of the applications you will probably have this finite activity uh, specifications. So in any case, I will be interested now in estimating the whole function for any value of x, basically. So for any value of the size, I want to know uh, this thing. So how can you recover that? So now this is a little bit more involved at first glance, but it actually, as you will see, it's not that complicated. And the idea is very simple. And I will basically heavily rely on this expansion or span, option spanning result that you might be aware of. So if you look at this thing, what is this? So conditional expectation of a function of the stock price at expiration is equal to the function of the futures price today. So you know this thing you know today, right? This thing you know today, plus an integral over options with different strikes, right? And so if you look at this, uh, okay, leaving aside the fact that we don't have option observations for any strike, okay? But if you suppose that for a minute that we have that thing, uh, then this integral, this integral is actually, this integral is actually known. If you have the option observations, this thing is known. And what that thing does is allows you to estimate the conditional expectation of any smooth function uh, of the terminal payoff. So very, it's a very useful result. <laughs> um, and it's also not very difficult to derive. But uh, simple results, uh, they, 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 yeah. So that, that was kind of a, it's a very nice result. I don't, uh, um, I saw it in Karen and Madan, maybe early iterations appeared somewhere. I don't know, Chris, whether you know that, but uh, I think that Bakshi also had something. So I, I don't know, I, I hope I'm giving the right credit to, to people. But uh, this shows up in there and somewhere hidden in their appendix. It's, it's, a, simple, it's a simple result uh, and very useful. So I'm going to use this result. This applies for general function, but what I'm going to use it for is the following. I'll apply this thing with the function, uh, with the characteristic function. Why? Because characteristic function preserves all the information about the return distribution. And so I should be able from there to recover somehow the levy measure or this jump intensity or jump distribution function whatever you want to call it, okay? So I'll apply again this formula, and I will apply it for the characteristic function. So basically, I will apply it for the function e to the power iu. The specific formula is here written, okay? And here for any value of the, of the characteristic function, uh, the, of the characteristic exponent, right? So you, you, have this, you have this function. It's a simple thing, which you can just code up in one or two lines, is, is this thing, okay? And now, what is the connection? What is the connection with the levy measure? Or how do you connect with the levy measure? Well, there is the thing, the, the thing which I told you now, we are looking at over a very small interval of time. You can pretend that volatility and the jump measure remain constant, they don't change. Or in other words, we are in a levy case, if you want. And there is this formula called the levy kinchin formula, which is written up here, which relates the conditional characteristic function with the drift term the volatility and the jump measure. Okay. So again, I have access to this from the data. I can estimate this conditional characteristic function, but what it really does, the logarithm of it, is just this expression here. I don't know A, I don't know sigma, and I don't know nu. What I'm trying to learn is nu. Right? That's what I'm trying to learn from this. So how do I do it from this? And what I give myself, the freedom, is to observe for any value of u, okay? For any value of u, I have, I have access to any value of u of this characteristic function. Well, it has to be possible because we know from the levy kinchin formula there is a one-to-one -one law between this conditional characteristic function and sigma and nu, okay? So there has to be a way to do it. And, and one way to do it is actually very simple. So look, the way this new, what is from my point of view now, nuisance parameters, 
is, uh, is very simple. This enters in u to the power one, and here enters to u to the power two. So why don't I differentiate the function here? If I differentiate once, this becomes i times a. If I differentiate twice, this thing disappears. If I differentiate three times, this thing goes away. This, however, doesn't. In fact, if you differentiate this the, under the integral, okay, what you will get is this. See, the third derivative of the conditional characteristic function is just this. Now I say, well, what is this? But if you look at this, well, if you look at this, this is just the characteristic function because it's e to the power i u x is the characteristic function of not my measure nu, but my measure nu multiplied by x to the power three. But x to the power three is known, right? So I, I can recover, I can recover x to the power three times nu from this because this is, again, the characteristic function. I can just apply Fourier inversion, right? The usual kind of result. So I just, I just do a Fourier inversion. And so that's basically it. So what I will do is, in a nutshell, is the following. I will estimate from the options, and so I will just fill you in the, with the details now. I will estimate from the options the conditional characteristic function here, okay? Um, differentiate it three times, and this will give me the characteristic function of x to the power three times the function I'm interested in. And then I will just apply for classical Fourier inversion, and that's basically, uh, that recovers the function. It recovers the function, this function here, okay? Now, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I already, yeah, um, the, t, the part where, okay, if the model was Levy, in other words, if I was assuming, so in the model, in the model is Levy, then it is for any t. Uh, model Levy means that this thing doesn't change as I change the capital T. But if you, if you believe that this thing changes over time, uh, I, I need the capital T to be small so that approximately stays constant. Yeah. Right. So that's why I need the capital T to be going down to zero. Yeah. For a Levy model, you don't, you don't need any of that. Yeah. yeah. So you are not making or you are making? I am making. No, no, because, no, because uh, okay, so this is just to, to motivate the things. In, uh, afterwards, I, I, uh, there's an approximation error, and then I control and derive the approximation error. So it's done for a general process. But it's much easier to explain in the Levy case, in the IID case. Yeah. So, okay. Now, if you, if you have done some of this uh, type of analysis, you know that um, it's not a good idea to differentiate estimators, okay? <laughs> That's, it's not very good. So, um, yeah, I got very excited because it's so easy now. It becomes like second derivative, third derivative, and then you are... Uh, kind of you directly kind of estimate the thing and you basically separate you don't need to make a stand on the uh, uh, you don't need to make a stand on the vol uh, on the volatility and any of this uh, stuff here but uh, yeah you probably prefer not to differentiate that many times estimators and so if you try to minimize it what you can do is uh, you can do the following alternatively uh, differentiate twice and so you will get rid of this guy and then, if you differentiate twice, uh, let me see here, yeah, this is what you will get. You will get the volatility plus the second kind of the characteristic function, but fx squared times nu. Uh, then the thing is that volatility, we don't know, but we can actually form estimators for it. And so you can bias correct and do these kinds of things. So you can do it that way too. Uh, with the, our first goal was to do this third derivative business uh, because it, it, it's, Theoretically, it's easier to, uh, to, to, to handle and do the stuff. Okay. Now, of course, in reality, you don't have, you don't have a continuum of strikes, but the same way the VIX index is calculated, we do the same thing here. There is a, it's, we have uh, uh, um, options on a grid of strikes, which is relatively dense. And so you're thinking that the gap between the strikes is uh, is small. So basically, and then what I can do, I can just get those, let me get here. This basically, I can estimate from the observed data, I can estimate these integrals by just simple Riemann sum, right? The discretization of the 
over the grid, right? So, so that's kind of, that's what we will do. And, uh, and hopefully the discretization error is not very big. Okay. And then, of course, options are observed with error. And the error, you want to be as little as parsimonious, assume as little as possible about the error. But uh, one thing which is kind of critical is, of course, that the, option, the error is centered. Uh, otherwise, it's not really an error, it's like a bias. So this thing is centered at zero, okay? And it has variance and, and things like that, okay? And this slide looks more scary than it actually is. It should be because there's really nothing, uh, uh, nothing tricky going on here. I plugged in, basically this is the Riemann sum discretization of the integral that I showed you before. I just, I just did it here. So you see you're just summing up over the options multiplied here and then this is the increments of the log strike, okay? And that's all it is. And then this is the, the third derivative of the log characteristic function. And then you just keep track of all of this, okay? So, this is really not difficult to compute either. And then you do just Fourier inversion. So, you have to invert. So, this is your, this is my estimator for the Fourier transform of the, of the function I'm trying to estimate. And then you multiply it by e to the power minus i u x, you see, and then you integrate over, over an interval which is kind of expanding. So you just drop the highest frequencies because they're estimated with imprecision. And the idea is that if the function you're trying to estimate is smooth, uh, the, the Fourier inversion, of the Fourier, inver uh, sorry, the Fourier transform of the function decays fast. And that's basically how this thing is, uh, uh, is based on. So for this key estimation, you do need smoothness basically of the thing you're estimating. Otherwise, uh, it's not going, to, uh, not going to work. And so, yeah, this is technicality, so I'm not going to get into the detail, just to say that the function needs to be in a class which is a smooth class, and the smoothness is uh, controlled by how fast is the Fourier transform of the function decaying, okay, at infinity. That's basically uh, what that thing is capturing. It's, these are Sobolev classes of uh, spaces, okay. So technical details, and then um, and then basically this is the result. So you, if you look at the uh, integrated squared error, right? Remember we're estimating a function, so you're trying to say how precise is the function, not only at the point uh, globally. And so one way to characterize this is just to look at the integrated squared error. So this is my estimator minus the true thing, and then it depends on a bunch of things. It depends on how smooth is the function you're trying to estimate. Typical classical non-parametric estimation. Of functions, and then it depends on the precision of the estimators, on the strike grid, on the time to maturity, and on and on and on. But okay, it's uh, yeah, we spent quite a bit of time getting those uh, each of those components. Okay, yeah. if you do it, this is what you will get. And actually, I thought that this was pretty pretty good. Um, so we estimated with this is from a Monte Carlo. We estimated. And so we simulated from a model which was fairly, uh, this is basically the model which we used, the parametric model we used here is this uh, model called uh, Carr, Gammon, Madan, your model. Have you, have you heard of this CGMY model? Okay. So basically it's a very general model for the jumps where you have a parameter which controls the size of the small jump, a parameter of the big jumps, a parameter for the, anyways, it's skewness, it's a lot of richly parameterized model which was uh, pop popularized, uh, uh, what, 15, 20 years ago, uh, nests a lot of models that have been used in practice. And so we simulated from those models, this is an affine model with time varying stochastic volatility and things like this. And then what we did is uh, we applied that procedure to the option gen data generated from it. And what we plot here are the levy, so are the, the, the jump distribution measures coming from the model, which is the solid line, um, against its estimator, which is the dashed line, okay? Different specifications, depending on whether we're in the low volatility regime, high volatility regime, etc. different values of the jump size. So we, uh, what is remarkable about this, uh, is that this thing works even if you look at specifications for which you have a lot of small jumps which you have entered into the into the model, which is something that the previous method is not going to uh, handle very well because you know 
two small jumps might be confused for a big one big jump, basically, if they're in the same direction. And that, 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 that procedure is going to separate and, and kind of tease out uh, those things. Um, so it's, I thought that it's remarkably well. I mean, of course, you, see, you can see the gap between the lines. You can see the gap between the lines, uh, especially if you look at the right tail. And so the right tail, I think, is just hopeless to recover. Well, just because there's no meat there, right? I mean, if the right tail, if you calibrate it correctly to the data, it's very thin. And then there's just not information, enough information in the data. You just, you can't, you can't nail it. But the left tail, you can recover. Uh, you can recover uh, relatively, I think, relatively, uh, relatively well. What I've done here, uh, what we've done here, um, uh, is that we stopped here we looked at really, we didn't go all the way down to zero, to zero jump size. Why? Because you see, what, you do, what you're doing here is if you want a really the true jump distribution, which might be exploding by the way, at zero, uh, you are dividing your estimator by x to the power three and x goes to zero, that thing is going to explode. So any small difference is going to be blown up. And so that's why I told you that this kind of idea of keep differentiating is probably not uh, the best thing to do, and you might want to do a second moment. And so, but in any case, we implemented it here this way. We implemented it on the data. You can see you get something reasonable uh, uh, out of this. And then we said, you know, I mean, in some sense, uh, it, it's nice from a theoretical point of view. So for a statistician, that's that's what they want, right? I mean, that's the function. That's I want to recover the whole function, and I'm kind of happy we managed to do that. But, um, but in a way, from a practical point of view, and if you followed my analysis earlier on, on these tail measures, what you probably most likely, what you really want, is some measure which captures the amount of the variation, the tail variation, okay, of the jump. So you really, what you probably want is, uh, uh, what you probably want is something like this, to recover the x squared new dx for some higher threshold or for arbitrary threshold but for, for, for higher threshold right and so just like what i did initially with this tail approximations and so then you can ask yourself well i mean uh, how about this right uh, this actually because you are uh, can i just plug in the new estimate i got here i plug it in and integrate it you can do that but it's kind of difficult to know what exactly um, or, or to prove actually the, 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 the behavior of that estimator. Alternatively, you can just realize that in fact, these tail integrals, they can be nicely expressed as integrals against Fourier transforms of the Levy measure. Okay. And we already know how to estimate these Fourier transforms, right? just the conditional characteristic function of the Levy measure and, and just plug them in here. And because you are integrating now this is much more precisely estimated, right? Because uh, in the integration is smoothing things out. And so you got actually a much more, something which is much more reliably estimated, but from a practical point of view, I, probably that's what I need, right? I mean, it's the, these integrals and not so much the, the, the function. So you can do this using this, uh, this integration business and you can prove this, uh, the behavior of these estimators uh, uh, as well. We did it in a, in a follow-up uh, work. Um, yeah, so that's just repeating what I, I said here. Okay. And so now, before we take the break, let me just, the last part here, uh, let me just talk a little bit about these fixed times of discontinuity, which I think that they are arguably probably, well, no. Okay. They're quite interesting in, the, in their own right, okay? So uh, these jumps, they're not typically the ones we model in our continuous time models, we don't, we don't, we don't model them usually, but I actually think that they're quite, you will see a few plots later on anyways, uh, illustrating that. So just to say, okay, it's a tech, as I told you, this is a technical jargon, which is used here, fixed times of discontinuity, okay? Uh, and you just, all it says is that, um, it says that I know at a certain point that a jump will arrive, okay? With positive probability. The models that we were looking so far has this feature that if I just look before the jump occurs, if I look at T star minus, okay? That is, the T star is the time when the jump happens, okay? And if I look just before the jump occurs, 
then ex ante, I expect the probability of jump happening exactly at that point in time is zero. Okay, that's all of this. Basically, it comes from the fact that you see the jump, the jump compensator, or the, ju the jump measure that we were looking at, was of this form, dt dx. In technical terms, it's Lebesgue in terms of time, which means that the jumps are uniformly distributed over time. Okay, and so and that's why the probability that it, the jump will land exactly at this point in time is zero. That's the feature of these models. In other words, if I'm looking over shorter and shorter and shorter intervals of time, the probability that the jump takes place gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It's proportional to the length of the interval. Okay, which is fine for many of the things which we are looking at in, uh, uh, for, for many, especially for the market index, it's probably fine, but there are situations in which you actually, if I'm sitting today, I know that at 2 p.m. Eastern time, there will be a jump when the, uh, when the, the Fed announces, uh, issues their FOMC announcement, right? That's kind of a, it's very likely. And so ex ante, you will expect that exactly at 2 p.m. there will be a, a, a jump. Well, another, uh, another situation is uh, when you, when you, um, the earning announcements, that, that they're probably even more, they, they generate even, they are much, much bigger, as you will see in a plot uh, uh, later on. So, well, how do things change in this case? Well, things actually change non-trivially in this particular case when we, are look, when we have forward-looking kind of data, uh, like options. And in fact, if you write now the characteristic function of the increment with that time of something happening, okay? Here's how it will look. You, you will have basically, see, you look at the, you look at um, the again conditional characteristic function and let's say that there is a time t star between little t and little t plus capital t where you know that a jump will arrive okay there will be announcement okay think about it this way there will be an announcement then the conditional characteristic function now will have this form it will be e to the power t times some function which depends on you not on time anymore and something which depends only on you and the time, basically the jump distance. So this is, okay, so to make things, uh, to simplify things, this is just the characteristic function of the jump at the announcement, okay? This is just the characteristic, just think about it, this is the characteristic function of the jump at the announcement. That's all that thing, that thing in the parentheses, it, in, it's kind of in a, in, a, in, a fancy, in a fancy notation. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that if I don't have this kind of fixed announcements, then the characteristic function or the logarithm of the characteristic function, I highlighted this thing in blue, will scale up with the horizon, right? Another way to say it is, think about what happens with the second moment, it's easier. The variance is proportional to time, right? The shorter the time, the shorter, the smaller the variance, okay? Just think about of a Brownian motion, right? The, the variance of the Brownian motion is equal to time, to the length of the time. And so, so, but then think what we're doing. So if I'm looking now over a small interval of time, I'm looking over a day, what do you do? How, how people treat uh, uh, quote options in black shoals implied vols? They annualize, right? Annualize, and so if I'm, uh, you're computing volatility over one day, you annualize it by multiplying by 252 or 365, whatever you convention you use, right? Now think about, what happens here if I'm expecting an announcement? You multiply it by 252, you will blow it up, right? Because it's a, it's a event. That, that's a fixed event. The, 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 the risk in it doesn't scale in time, right? So you should not be scaling this thing in time. And just to illustrate to you that this thing has a real bite, here's what you will do if you are to compute the consequences of this, if you are to compute Black-Scholes implied vol or the VIX basically, I did here the VIX, but the, the, the same thing happens with the black shells implied vol for Facebook, for one individual stock, okay, name stock. If you calculate the black shells implied vol from, uh, from, the, uh, from the short dated options. Now what you see is something which is insanity, right? I mean, um, and so, uh, so I did not know again un until I started looking at individual names 
that this, these effects are so prevalent. Uh, and that's why I start looking at these earning announcements uh, in follow-up work, because I look at this. I mean, what is going on here? If you look at these spikes, they're really huge. I mean, we're talking about volatility going from 40 to 120 and then going down, right? It's not because really people expected the, the and what kind of a volatility model will give you that, right? I mean, you will, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, we, we usually try to fit the traditional volatility, AR1 process, et cetera, on this type of dynamics, it's not going to work very well, right? I mean, that's going to be a, that's going to be a disaster, in fact. So what's happening here? What are these spikes? Well, these are spikes are driven by earning announcements which happen every quarter, right? Four quarters per year, okay? And that's why you approximately see them at, with that, that, that frequency basically is the length of a quarter, okay? And, uh, uh, and there each quarter and then when you're looking at i'm looking at one week that's a non-trivial event but then you multiply if it's a one week to expiration to annualize it because these are annualized volatility numbers as usual you have to multiply that number by uh by 52 right because they are 52 weeks and so you just blow it up so it's not like i expect the volatility to persist like this for a, a year it's just over that short interval of time but annual, annualizing that thing is the wrong thing to is the wrong thing to do so it is amazing. So, so um, if you go on, if you go and look at, uh, so I was stuck for uh, most of the stuff I've done, I've done with uh, market market index options. You don't see this type of plots. Okay, I mean, so you otherwise, you, if you, I mean, people, yeah. Anyways, people have noticed this, I guess, with individual name options, but uh, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, that this was so big. For for SPX, you can still see that thing happening. Uh, around the FOMCs and around a bunch of announcements sometimes. Well, I'm being recorded. I was going to make a joke, but now you see, because I'm being recorded, I'm not going to make a political joke. Uh, so uh, there are other, some other announcements which generated in 2020 and 2016 and stuff, uh, uh, option markets to move by a lot. You can guess, make wild guesses, okay, uh, about what was happening. So, and so even there, but, but the size of this kind of, this type of effects are going to be uh, much, 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 much smaller. So. The first thing, um, okay, so what I wanted to do in, uh, uh, as a first thing is um, for the S&P 500 options where this is really not as extreme is just to see are there a lot of these events because you might even ask, you might, if you think about this, you might say that, well, I mean, how do we treat the weekends, right? Are they exactly events like this? I know they're coming. I know markets are closed. It's limited time, so and they just like a jump like that, right? Uh, treated like this. So that's why I was thinking originally. I wasn't expecting that for individual names, this is so obvious and apparent, and so there's no need to test for it, okay? And so what I'm going to, uh, going to do is just here, what I'm going to do is basically tell you how to test or how to look in the option data and say, well, there is an, an event like this. The market is expecting something like this to be happening over the next period. Again, for the market index options, it's not so obvious. You have those, even at FOMCs. Not all FOMCs uh, trigger this type of event. But the more important question afterwards is actually, well, measure those, extract the information about those, and actually think what happens to volatility at those announcements. And that, that's something that uh, I've been working afterwards on, uh, start working on this. Okay, so let me just tell you, in, that, that's not, it's not very complicated and basically builds on again this conditional characteristic function. So it's not very, it's not very complicated thing to do. And so here though, what I will do, I will now allow myself uh, to use two maturities, not only one maturity as I was using until now, but basically I will use two times to expiration, capital T1 and capital T2, okay? And what I will say basically is the following thing. Look, if you go, let me go back here. If this mess was not here, so if this fixed time, fixed jump was not here, as I told you, the conditional characteristic function grows linearly in time, just like the variance grows linearly in time, okay? And so I will ask myself, okay, well, if I look at the conditional characteristic function, does it scale across horizons proportionally to the time to maturity, to the time to expiration? And that will be my test. So if there's no such event, so if, 
those who are pricing the options were not expecting any of these type of events to occur, then what you should see is that the characteristic function scales linearly in time. That is, if I take the logarithm of the characteristic function, uh, and you will see that it's basically, it's proportional to time, just like variance is proportional to time. So I do it with characteristic functions so that I can, so that this is really a one-to-one. -one. And the, the variance is just an implication of, of, of this, okay. And if there is an event, if there is a, if, if I, if there is this type of event, uh, kind of an event risk, okay, then the thing doesn't scale up linearly in time, okay. So that will be my test. That's in a nutshell is the test. And so what I can do is uh, I can look at my, I can calculate this conditional characteristic function from one maturity. I can calculate it from the other maturity, scale it up appropriately, and look at the difference. And if this is really no event is expected, then this thing is just measurement error, okay? And I can hope and characterize the behavior of this thing because this basically, if it's a measurement error, you can derive a kind of a central limit theorem. So it's like a chi-square type statistic, basically. It will be something like this, okay? Okay, this is, uh, um, yeah, some fancy econometrics related to that is basically you are looking at functions so you're looking at functions because over the characteristic exponent, and then you can say that there's a central limit theorem for that thing. And on the basis of this, you can characterize the behavior of this function here uh, under the null. It's some kind of a, you are squaring normals, which are correlated across the U's, but you know how much they are correlated, so you can characterize uh, this, uh, the asymptotic variance in the end of the day. And what all you have, well, this probably sounds very intimidating, but it should not be because uh, the way you do it, okay, so I'm, I keep <laughs> going in the wrong, pressing the wrong button, but the way you do it is just you simulate this distribution. So it's very, it's not really at all uh, difficult. Okay. Um, okay, and what happens under the alternative? Well, under the alternative, there can be two, um, it depends on where you, where that event is. Does this event happen before the two options expire, or it happens when the first, after the first option has expired, but not the second maturity, okay? And so if, if it's in the first case, if it expires before both of the option expiration dates, then uh, basically what will happen, or rather if it expires after the first option has, okay, if the event happens after the first option has expired, then this, the first conditional characteristic function converges to one, to the number one, okay? And then the second one just converges to the characteristic function of the, the jump size, okay? And if this is not the case, in this case, both are converging to the same thing. If, if, if the event happens before even the first option, the first expiration that has taken place, then basically they are both converge to the same thing. Either way, this gap, which I showed you on the previous slide, is going to be a non-negligible number, and that's going to give you basically, uh, and, uh, and that's going to give you power of the test. And so you can formulate the test, uh, testing whether there is an event or no event, and it's properly sized, asymptotically at least. I applied it uh, in year 2017, okay? So, uh, <laughs> Um, two S and P500 index options, okay? And these are the P values because you wouldn't know what the critical values are, so it's easier to report P values. And remember, P values, higher P values means that you don't reject. And so if we have a conventional size of say 5%, so what you will see here is that there are a bunch of guys which are absolutely unambiguously on the bottom with the P value of zero. So where there's absolutely no doubt something was expected to happen basically. Um, and um, then I went back and checked, uh, but they're not, that, these are done by weeks. So you have 52 weeks in 2017, okay? Um, because back then I can use only Monday, Wednesday and Friday option expiration. I cannot do the, what I can do now every day of the week. Okay, so I was doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so a lot of, uh, a number of those events were FOMCs actually. But there were also some events which were actually not directly related to, well, yeah, you can, uh, that, that's, that can be so confusing. You can 
kind of think, okay, something, this is telling me something must have been expected, and then you can go and search for this news, right? And then always, there's always something, okay, but was that really the thing? I don't know. Uh, so, for example, yeah, I will show you one, uh, one, one, one observation later on. There was no FOMC, no anything, but I think it was the European Central Bank was issuing something. Now, I don't know why this was affecting so much the US market, but it, it triggered it. Like, anyways, so the point is that these events here, they're not that big as for the individual stocks. They're not like day and night type events, but there are, but there are a few of them uh, out uh, on them. Uh, yeah, there was one of them, for example, was the IMF conference, which happens in April. In one of the years, the IMF conference, for some reason, it was affecting, basically, it was happening over the weekend, and it was affecting kind of this, this scaling property was basically uh, completely off. So they were expecting that there will be quite a bit of big chunk of news released. Yeah. You mean? Um, Like, like what measures you have? Ah, oh, okay. No, no, no. I didn't think. No, I didn't think about that. Ah, okay. So you're saying, okay, if this, okay. So you're thinking, okay, if basically that's telling you market participants are expecting something to happen, so it should be reflected in something else as well, basically, right? Yeah, that's a good point. No, no, I, I did not think of in in this way. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that can be. Yeah. In any case, I mean, you can think about applying this thing now. Before, I couldn't apply it so much because we didn't have maturities expiring every day. But now you will kind of be thinking, well, are we treating the weekends differently from the way we treat regular days because markets are closed or semi-closed, right? Uh, it's a jump, but is it the same type of jump that we have in kind of in regular times? So there, there, there's more. To, I think that with the data now, uh, I think one, one can do a little bit more. Okay, and I will wrap it up so that we can have uh, coffee, but we just say, okay, you can test whether there was an event. If you're looking at individual stocks, there's no need to test because you know when the event is. So basically there's no point to test whether the event is just, so it's much more interesting is just to recover that basically that event or the recover the, 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 say the distribution of that event. And so now, but in any case, the way I've written it here is assume that I really, the, the econometrician is really doesn't, is clueless and basically doesn't know even when the event happened. And so the first thing is, well, figure out whether the event happened before the first expiration or after the first expiration. So it's not that difficult. You basically have to see how the, the characteristic function scale. So let's just not um, spend time on this. But basically, once you figure out where is the event, is it before the first expiration or after the first expiration date, then you will as assign, basically, you need to do a bias correction type thing to remove the normal type of risk, which is around the event time, okay? And that depends on where this event happened. So there's this, these are bias correction terms, but they're all based on this characteristic function. So that's not that really difficult in reality to do. And then you just do the Fourier transform, and that's it. There's nothing, there's really nothing which uh, else going on here. Okay. So these are the bias correction terms, but I don't want to scare you with those. Uh, and so you can do the same thing. You can just basically, it's a function you're estimating, and then you can look at the integrated squared error of the function. Okay. And you recover it in June, of, uh, June 5th of 2017. If I remember right, this was a date when something happened in Europe ECB was issuing something and then it triggered, it triggered basically a, a jump like this. You, you look at it, it looks very symmetric, uh, that type of jump. Uh, it's not like this heavily left tail skewed type of jump that we usually recover in the normal time. So it looks more like an uncertainty type of thing basically that's generated and not very big in size. You see this is like a 1% kind of uh, spread. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, well, that's the end of this set of slides exactly at the time for the break, more or less. Uh, maybe, uh, well, I'm just, uh, any questions actually, maybe I should ask, yes. Uh, 